Welcome to Arts for the Health of It, a podcast where you will discover creative ways to improve your health and well-being. Someone may have told you that art isn't for you, but they were wrong. Anyone can create arts for the health of it. No talent or experience necessary. I'm just a little songbird. Try to fly my way homeward with the melody and I make the beat. Don't know where it'll take me, take me. Cause when I'm in the dark of night, I sing my way back to the light. Come along with me and your heart will see that a song changes everything. Oh. Wyckoff was a pioneer in the arts and health field. Uh, he has led medical humanities and hospital arts programs and used the arts to advance public health and foster healing and resilience by active duty and veteran military. But I'm not done yet because he's also a professional artist and an arts administrator who just happens to be the vice president of the National Organization of Arts and Health, who we're partnering with on this podcast here, this little podcast journey we're on. And he's the marketing director for Aesthetics Inc, which uses art and design to create uplifting hospital environments. So I'm so grateful to have you on our very pilot, our very first pilot episode, because I think <laughs> you're going to bring such great knowledge into this whole uh, this whole conversation. So thank you, Naj. Well, thank I'm you. I'm so pleased to be here, and I'm so pleased that you guys are launching this uh, uh, podcast. I think it's so important. You know, this is, we're bringing the uh, news about the arts and health to a larger audience. And I think that's just so wonderful and so needed. Yes. And uh, it's, help, it's gonna help people recognize things that are going on in their own communities and opportunities that they have in their own communities to make a difference. I also have someone else here with us, obviously, Constanza. So I was, I was writing your intro. Oh no. I was like, well, <laughs> She's my boss. She's my boss. <laughs> and she's my friend. And that's it. So then I didn't know how else to introduce you. So I asked the writers of the podcast, which we don't have any writers on this podcast. <laughs> so then I went a little bit further and someone um, wrote an intro for you and I wanted to read it to you. What? Okay. Right? I don't know about this. No, you don't know. Because this is the fun part about producing this podcast is you can have surprises <laughs> and not tell people what's going on. Okay, I'm ready. All right, so here's your intro. My name is Kim Childs. As the mother of an extremely outgoing child, I watched as she dove into each new situation with vigor and joy and worked every room with her bright smile and winning nature. She never met a stranger. And when she walked out, she knew almost no one's name, though she talked to everyone. She took on leukemia with grace at the age of 13 and used her outgoing nature to be the darling of local news outlets. They loved interviewing her, and she was a bright light in every event that she was involved with. Hers was a make-a-wish miracle that sent her family to Australia with only three months' notice to the Sydney Olympics, and her poster-sized picture on the headquarters wall was displayed for years. Though her dreams of a normal teenage life were crushed, she took what was given her and made the most of it, excelling in her academics and finding new sports that didn't involve trying to run with the drop-foot reflex from her chemotherapy. When she first began volunteering on the cancer ward, she called me on occasion, hyperventilating from the PTSD of going back into a hospital cancer ward. So did she quit? Absolutely not. She got herself therapy to deal with the trauma of her own cancer so she would be able to minister to others on similar journeys. It is extremely satisfying to see her take all of these characteristics, experiences, and her considerable intellect and talent to step out to form Hearts Need Art, a holy calling. Besides having no money for such a venture, her lack of focus on details, thank you ADD, <laughs> made every step of the formation extremely difficult. She had to learn skills she lacked by sheer determination and research. Nothing about organizing was natural to her and the skill is not. <laughs> I have to hire people like she you. Richard. Had to come up with systems and processes to remember names and even make sure she got out of her home with her keys and her wallet. <laughs> Sometimes in frustration, she would say, I just want to be an artist. But she charged ahead undeterred and found people to assist her. That's me. And got her nonprofit off the ground. 
Her natural stage presence was enhanced with knowledge that her aunt imparted and helped her hone the ability to present clearly and convincingly to an audience to raise money and awareness for the plight of cancer patients. Nothing about the formation of Hearts Need Art happened without huge sacrifices and effort. Meet my daughter, Constanza Rader, a young woman I am inspired by and learn from in most every conversation we have. Oh my gosh, mom. That is from your mother. <laughs> So also, because you, I get to produce this show and have surprises, I have someone here who wants to say hi to you. What? Can we bring him out? Hi, Stanzi. Hey, Dad. Uh, want to see it's that. Stanzi's dad, everyone. It is. That Kurt the Coast smile. I love it. And um, by the way, it's my fault if she has ADHD. I lose my keys all the time. It's true. Uh, about every time I go to the car, it's usually two, maybe three trips because I forget stuff. Get in the car, have to go back into the house, get whatever I need to to come back. So but what, I'm really, I'm so proud of you, and uh, wish you the best in your, in this this phase of what you guys are doing with Hearts Need Art. Oh, thank you, Dad. Thank you, Rich. What uh, <laughs> good qualities did she get from you? <laughs> well, um, her beauty she got from her mom. <laughs> um, so I, I think what she, her entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah, uh, we share that. We're kindred kindred spirits when it comes to uh, thinking innovatively and doing doing stuff that the normal way of doing things we don't like. We don't like convention. <laughs> Probably mostly because our brains don't work conventionally. <laughs> but my dad is highly creative. And one of the ways that he harnesses that is in entrepreneurship. And I, I am grateful to have had him as an example growing up. So I love you, Daddy. Love I you love you, Tony. Mm -hmm. So your, your dad's going to stay in the green room and watch. Also in the green room is your mom. Uh, what? Who's oh, watching. Mom, no pressure. But she, <laughs> she yelled at me multiple times and said, I will not be on camera. All right. Okay, mom, so you just she, hang out. So she, she shares she the hand that we see every now and then. Yeah. My my mom <laughs> just completed her last radiation treatment last week for for her breast cancer. So huge oh, shout out to my mama. Yes. Um, it's been interesting being on the side of being a patient as a cancer patient and then on the other side of being a caregiver, someone that you love going through cancer. They're very, very different experiences. Right. Um, they suck they both suck <laughs> well thanks joe for jumping in thank you all appreciate it nice I look forward to hope you enjoy the episode absolutely all right richard I, yeah richard you're you know this is why i'm here why <laughs> you, you just want me to cry before we start yeah, i thought that'd be a great way to start it off all cool. i can say richard I'm, I'm sort of glad you don't know me as that well <laughs> You don't know. This hour is not over yet. Dave. I this know. It's going to get over. rich. <laughs> if you know anything about me, you know I like surprises. I other can see that. Me. Yes. I want to talk about this podcast a little bit. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> this little podcast that we're doing here. Arts for the Health of It um, is a partnership between Hearts Need Art, Creative Support for Patients and Caregivers, and NOAA. And that um, is partly why, besides obviously the vast knowledge that Nash has on everything in the world, um, <laughs> why he is here. Nash, I want you to talk about Noah and Stanzi, I want you to talk about Hearts Need Art, um, uh, what they are and what y'all are up to in 2021. Uh, the National Organization for Arts and Health, or NOAA, really is the umbrella organization. You know, it serves the whole field of arts and health. Um, one of our roles is advocacy and advo advocating on behalf of the arts and health. So we work with Americans for the Arts, we work with the, the State Arts Council, we work with the Creative Art and Therapies to that end to really help uh, lobby Congress and State Arts Councils and foundations and all these different types of funding and policy type places to you know support arts and health. Uh, so when we do that, uh, when we're connected, we try to bring uh, people from different aspects of the field together. Uh, we're a place where the creative arts therapies, you know, if you're a poet therapist, you have a home in poet therapy. So we also serve as the home for uh, the professional artists in the field of arts and health. So we're their home, we're the, where a lot of artists can connect with each other and learn from each other. And we try to foster 
uh, research. We try to make it, find out what type of research is really needed. Tons of research is done, but you, you need some resources that can get the attention of the hospital administrator or the public health administrator or the dean of the medical school. And uh, so we try to find that out. So we have these leadership summits where we bring leaders in medical care, medical education, public health, and so on and so forth, and major funders and major national go governing bodies together to tell us what is it that keeps them up at four, the, at four in the morning and to see where we in the arts might be able to make a difference and then focus. So one right now, big focus is on burnout. Mm. And, uh, and so we're, we have an initiative on that. And uh, we have a lot of partner organizations, the you know, arts and medicine at the Un University of Florida is a very important one that's taken a big lead on public arts and public health. And uh, so, you know, that's uh, where, you know, where our whole thing is to try to support, you know, organizations like Art, um, Arts for the Health of It and have them help them connect with other organizations and people and help them do their job better. Uh, and then for hearts, for hearts need art, we, you know, pre pandemic, we're providing all of our services in person. And now we're providing all of our services virtually, which has uh, really opened up a lot of opportunities for our work. Um, just even this last week, we launched a new initiative in a stroke and cardiac rehabilitation unit, mm. um, where our our musicians call in to an iPad that's on the unit that's on a rolling stand and then it gets rolled into a room and then rolled into the next room and they, they play music. Um, that particular initiative is made possible by um, a grant from project music heals us shout out to them. Sure. Um, and then we're about to launch a, a similar virtual program at Northwestern in Chicago um, and another hospital uh, locally. Anyway, so it's just been a really, uh, really interesting time. And we're supporting, um, providing arts experiences for support groups around the country to provide uh, creative, um, creative outlets, expressive outlets for for people during, during this crazy time. Um, we also just launched our gratitude grams program to deal to help um, kind of part of that arc initiative and in NOAA to help support burnout and healthcare providers. So our um, so if there's any healthcare providers listening, you can go to heartseenart.org slash gratitude grams and enroll in the program. Or if you just want to send a gratitude gram to a healthcare worker that you know, you can do that on that page as well. And when someone enrolls in our program, they get matched with an artist and they get every week a personalized email and three to five minute video of gratitude and also some sort of artistic expression, whether it's a song that's played for them or a little doodle that they can do at their desk or a little writing prompt um, and just giving them a moment to <sighs> breathe and a little moment for themselves and a very genuine expression of gratitude for the sacrifice that they're making. Who is the podcast for? Mm. Yeah. I mean, this is, this podcast is really for anyone who's interested in learning how and why the arts impact our health and well being. So that could be um, someone who's just very interested in, improving their health and well-being in general and maybe hasn't thought of the arts as a way to do that. It's also for healthcare providers and health professionals who are wanting to learn more about this field that's quickly becoming, uh, that is, has this growing body of evidence around its efficacy and is quickly starting to, to become part of the standard of care. Um, also, f of course, for patients, family caregivers, anyone who's wanting to um, more tools in their toolbox to cope with health crises. Um, we hope that this helps to inspire you to explore your creativity in ways that you maybe haven't thought of and really invite you, especially for people that that um, have been told that they can't do art, that art isn't for them, that, you know, you're bad at this, maybe do something else. Uh, especially for those people, <laughs> we're here to tell you that it is for you. It's for everyone. everyone. You don't have to be quote unquote talented to experience the, the health benefits of arts engagement. And it's for artists and creative arts therapy. Mm -hmm. 
and yeah. designers and architects and to say, you've got a home. Yes. And, you know, come to Noah, come get involved in this, tell us your stories. And uh, our, we want to help you do better. Oh, oh yeah. I'm going to learn so much. You know, we're going to meet so many people we don't know and so many programs we don't know about. And we're also going to find out needs, you know, mm. you know, we're going to find out, I think, where there are opportunities. Mm. That's always going to be one of my questions. And I was going to say, Naj probably knows it all. So he isn't going to learn anything from this. But what are you both hoping to learn from from the podcast? I'm new to the field of arts and health. And so I'm really excited to get to talk to some of my heroes in arts and health, people like Nash, who've been part of the formation of this field. It's so exciting. Um, and I'm just excited to learn from other people, uh, from research, that new research that's happening, from new and uh, innovative work that's happening. I think all of that will help to give a platform for all these really cool things that are that are happening in the field. I'm just super stoked about that. So I want to jump ahead a little bit and then sure. kind of move back. Um, for both of you, when did you do you remember the first time each of you heard the term arts and health? Because it's not widely known, except if you're in this little bubble of ours. Um, so, and you both, I know, were artistic before, I'm sure, the word, the phrase came into your lives. So, do you remember when you heard that? Well, I think, I think Naj yeah. was probably part of creating that term. Uh, yeah, well, pretty early on, yeah. When I was in kindergarten, we had this, you know, teacher who introduced me to paints. I never had a paintbrush in my hand before kindergarten. And it was like some light bulb went off. And um, and I just, they couldn't tear me away from working on these really cheap newsprint pads with this, the big fat brushes of tempera paint. But it was in uh, sixth grade from the usual kid type paintings and all of a sudden I did one that went from that to something that was looked three dimensional and realistic and had prescription or perspective and all that. And it was like a, a change, you know, there's these, uh, every now and then to be those little jumps. And within a couple of years, I knew I wanted to go to Pratt Institute because I heard it was the best art college in the country. That's where I ended up going. Mm. But it was, um, I will say though, that as a, as a teenager, um, I did some artworks that uh, well, for some people were pretty unsettling, but also very profoundly healing. Let me give an example. I did this large painting of a of a person sitting there sort of huddled and there was no skin on the body. It was all imagined if it was just the muscles without the skin. It was a very, you know, powerful painting. And it was we had a ski lodge and it was hanging on the wall. And the number of people were profoundly moved by that. And it and I did other things like that that I could just see, you know, connected people in a very different way. And that's where I sort of got the feeling that art is something more than doing a painting. I mean, one hand, I was doing arts and healing work before I knew that term. This is with when I was at the Cathedral St. John the Divine and using the arts to support uh, people who are HIV positive. And at that time, that was a death, there was, that was a death sentence. There's no living with AIDS. And that was a, a very profound, life altering experience for me as a professional artist to really see how profound the arts could make a difference in somebody's life and somebody who is, um, in a sense, you knew it was gonna die and not well in the near future and, uh, and how it transformed people's lives. Um, but it was a, f a few years after that when I got hired at Dartmouth and get recruited by Sierra Coop to work in the med school, that's where I first learned about the term arts and health. Um, and, uh, and I became a very early uh, developer of the field through the Society for the Arts and Healthcare, which, which had just been started, started two years earlier. And I probably, like, like Naj, I was doing the work even before I knew there was a term for it. Um, I grew up in a musical family. My <laughs> Shout out again to my mom. She was my first voice teacher. Um, I'm pretty sure as soon as I was talking, she had me next to the piano singing um and so music and performance was always kind of a part of our lives and then after my diagnosis 
um, as a teenager, there was an organization in my hometown in Santa Cruz, California called Jacob's Heart. Shout out to Jacob's Heart. They support families who have kids with cancer. And they had a group for teens and young adults who had cancer. And we would get together um, and make art. Like that was really kind of our group. They had different artists that came in that taught us different mediums. And the social worker would kind of lead us through um, some art therapy type work. And I, it was kind of my reintroduction to um, visual arts. My great aunt, um, my great aunt Ray taught me watercolors as a kid. And then as a teenager, using this as a way to um, heal from my trauma was profound. And because there were so many you know, a, a big diagnosis like that at any age is really hard, but especially as a teenager, there's a lot of negative emotions and negative emotions, if they aren't expressed and processed and dealt with, they just stick in your body and cause more pain and disease and illness. And, but I didn't always feel comfortable or even know how to express what I was feeling verbally, but I didn't have to... <laughs> a blank canvas couldn't judge me, you know, it was just there. And um, I could express all the junk and then transform it. And then I had power over it. Um, so it was a very empowering experience. And then when I moved to San Antonio, uh, after I finished treatment and got my music degree and all of that, I started um, volunteering to sing for adult cancer patients at a local oncology unit. And I was really pretty shocked by the difference in supportive services available to adult patients compared to what I had access to um, in a pediatric hospital. Um, and the, you know, the, a lot of patients I worked with weren't much older than I was when I finished treatment and they lived in the hospital for weeks and months at a time and couldn't leave the unit and couldn't go outside. And it was just like, you know, it was like prison without yard time. It was, you know, pretty, pretty abysmal. So um, I just took what I had and I knew that music was healing for me. And so I just started kind of going room to room and singing for people. And it was uh, truly transformative for not just them, but for me, you know, I really had to come like my mom mentioned in the intro, had to come face to face with my own past trauma and really heal from that so that I could serve and be more fully present. Um, when I was looking into starting an organization, I was doing a lot of research. I think I came across, um, uh, University of Florida Center for Arts and Medicine. And I was like, oh my gosh, there's other people doing this. Yeah, and it's like yeah. a whole thing. And it was so exciting to find my tribe and then to discover Noah. And as soon as I found out they were doing their first convention just up the road in Austin from us here in San Antonio, I was like, oh, I'm so there. And it was, it was um, really just that. It was like discovering my tribe, this like quirky group of idealistic, um, kind hearted visionaries and just wanting to use their creativity to bring more light into the world and to, to support people that were going through some of the hardest times in their lives. And, um, it was very exciting for me. <laughs> well, that's what it was like for me when I was at Dartmouth and I, I met Janice Palmer from Duke, and I met uh, Annette Ridnauer from uh, San Diego, and I met Helen Orm and a few others. There was just about 60 or so you know, spread across the country. And it was literally like finding, oh, I'm not alone doing this work, and it mm. has a name. Yeah. And, uh, and just, I mean, uh, this woman, Reverend Sally Bailey, she started the first arts program in a hospice in the United States at Yale. And I met others like that who are just profound pioneers in the, in, in the field. Uh, Peter Senior over in England, who really was a f person who really sort of codified arts and health. Mm. So, yeah, it was great. Can, we, can you guys talk about what is arts and health and how does that differ from the therapies? Well, it includes the therapies. Uh, arts and health is a overall uh, field that you know it one it's arts and medical the medical humanities 
in, in medical education. So it's arts and, and medical education. Um, it's also uh, arts in health care, in medical care. It's arts in public health. Uh, it's arts in the decor and decoration and design of health facilities. Uh, so one, it works in a lot of different places. So there's a, a major, of course, uh, subset is the creative arts therapies and the expressive arts therapies. And they use, you know, they are trained therapists who use the arts for a therapeutic outcome. They know how to do that. And they've taken uh, a lot of training to do that and how to measure the outcomes. And uh, the use of the artists working in healthcare, one hand, it goes back to the ancient Paleolithic times. But um, the arts, they may have a therapeutic benefit. You know, you think of the, what you were doing down at the University of Florida, or, but it, that's not what they're trained to do. They are, they are like teaching artists, shall we say, or professional artists who work in the healthcare, and they use the arts to take people from away from pain, to give them an opportunity to express themselves, uh, to have all sorts of different things, and they are getting better and better at measuring their outcomes, and they're highly trained artists who work in healthcare. But it's, it's a little bit different in the creative arts therapies because they have a, uh, uh, they use some of the same tools for different outcomes. And really, a, a really great hospital arts program, as an example, has about an equal mix of both. I couldn't say it better myself. You know, our, <laughs> our, our goals are a little bit different, you know, the, and something that I think is so cool about arts in general, and I think something that we're trying to highlight in this podcast is that just the the act of creating and doing art is profoundly therapeutic and profoundly impacts our health and well-being um and it's important that we equip our population with these tools to be able so that we we can grapple with some of the really harsh realities that we have to face just being humans i think one of the biggest challenges that I or one of the biggest frustrations that I came to discover in my work with adult patients is, you know, I've worked with thousands of, of patients over the years. And one of the first things that they usually tell me when they um, when I offer an art class or music or whatever it is, it's like, oh, I'm not an artist. Oh, I'm not artistic. Oh, what, you know, <laughs> fill in the blank. And when I ask them, like, well, why do you think that they always have a story of wounding around their creativity where someone told them at some point that they couldn't draw or they were tone deaf or they, you know, whatever it was, someone important to them in their life shamed them around, there was some shame around their creativity. And so they just stopped there. And so we've really, we've kind of, as a society, we've outsourced and professionalized creativity and art making. And that hasn't, you know, we've always had, you know, artists who specialize in kind of leading arts and leading music and all of that. But historically, everyone participated in art. And it's only in the, you know, in more modern times that we've, we've kind of, perf you know, segregated it just to the professionals and maybe children and stay at home moms can do crafty things. And that's okay. But everyone else like, stop wasting your time. Um, so anyway, I, I would work with these people. And then when we would reintroduce art making to them, just make just like, here's, here's a colored pencil. <laughs> and, and, and just the profound transformation that would happen when, when someone picks up a colored pencil or picks up paint, or um, picks up a ukulele to learn. It's, the the transformation that happens is truly profound you know so many patients would say oh my gosh i'm an artist i never knew it just is this reawakening that happens and um you know we know that engaging the arts helps improve patient outcomes like this is real stuff it's not just you know flu flu um woo you know woohoo stuff it's real it has a real impact on our um our health and how the chemicals operate in our body and all of that. So, well, that's what I was going to ask. Like, uh, who can, I feel like the answer is everyone. And I want to dive into that, but like who can benefit from arts and health? And I think it's, it, the answer is everyone. And it's also not just someone who's sitting in a hospital bed for months at a time. It's the person who's there 
before that even happens as sort of an intervention of, you know, you can, the arts do a lot of things like reduce stress and reduce, all, you know, where that helps you not get sick. <laughs> well, and, and an example of that is the arts are used in, in the military pre-deployment, deployed and returned and helping them re turn into, into society. So that's an example of how the arts can work in a, in a and sort of a certain arc of settings. Mm -hmm. And I would also say, in terms of what you were saying earlier, is that you not only did all these things, but you gave them time. In mm -hmm. other words, you didn't, uh, you know, so often, and you didn't have this white lab coat on, and you're not taking all these notes. You know, often a doctor can only spend a few minutes with them, or the nurse not a lot. And often patients feel like they are a disease and not a you know, not a person. And in hospitals, they often refer to as the cancer room 302. And so all of a sudden you come in and you have time and you get them engaged and ask them, uh, give them choice and you give them dignity as well as you take them on this journey. And that's profoundly important. That has to do with giving somebody dignity mm. uh, and seeing them as a person and not as a disease. And that's a powerful just in that. Uh, so I just wanted to, you know, add that too as well, because I think it's so important. But yeah, so arts can happen in a wide variety of circumstances. You think of after like a, a disaster, you think of after 9-11, the number of people who would create these memorials do, uh, out of photographs and all sorts of stuff to people who had died or they had lost. And we often see this by roadsides where somebody had a, a car death, you know, people create a little shrine. And that's, that's expressing themselves creatively to help them deal with trauma. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, the use of the arts and healing can happen in a, such a wide variety of ways and in a wide variety of circumstances. And, uh, you know, we as a society are having a, a increasing role, um, experiences of trauma, uh, trauma. And we also are having a, you know, a burnt out um, medical and first responder community. And the role of the arts in helping address that is profound and needed. Or people are becoming incredibly isolated. Loneliness is becoming an epidemic. And again, the arts can make a profound difference because just the way you describe, you know, the arts, uh, even through this media, you can engage people and get them doing something. And all of a sudden time goes by and they make a difference, they have a way of communicating, they have a way of self-reflection, all sorts of things, or finding they're not alone with their feelings. That's very profound. Mm. I think one of the things that makes it challenging to like pinpoint the impact that the arts make is because there's something about the arts that just cuts through all the layers, all the armor, right? All the armor that we wear, especially when we're scared. And it just cuts through and reaches and caresses the heart of a person. And when that happens, when they feel connected with, when they feel seen and heard and loved in such a profound way, all of a sudden they're freer to make better choices and better decisions for themselves and their health and their well-being. And all of a sudden they're more compliant with their care team and they, you know, will take their medication or whatever is needed to care for themselves. And I think if we miss that part, if we miss connection, when people are dealing with health crisis or really anyone in, the, in society, we're going to continue to struggle with public health issues, with, um, with division in our society, like if you don't connect with people first, they can't change, you know, they can't make, make, make better decisions. Um, and so that, you know, and that's like just one way that the arts can impact a, holistically a patient's experience in a healthcare setting specifically. You know, artists fundamentally, no matter what their discipline in, are really trained observers. They're mm -hmm. observers of human life. So when they come in and, and meet a patient, for example, in a hospital setting or meet a prisoner in a correction facility or whatever it is, or a, a, you know, a youth at risk in some other more violent situation, all of a sudden that person is feeling heard, being observed. Somebody's paying real tremendous attention to them and, and feeling listened to. And that is so 
you know, that's a big part of it as well. And that's so important is that sense of um, doing that. And another thing, of course, is that I've learned it's very important. I never ask anybody to do anything I would do. Mm. So if I'm going to want somebody to make themselves vulnerable mm. to me or to a group, I do it first. Mm-hmm. You know, I create that safe space for them. And I love using ritual as part of it, you know, so that you declare a space safe in, in a certain way. If you think of like a street musician, he draws, draws a circle and within which he performs, he created that safe space. And mm-hmm. to me, that's very important when you work with an individual or group as you create that safe space. So maybe it's very slightly religious, a realist, a ritualistic way, and you end it the same way. And what takes place in that space you know, stays there. That's really part of the part of the vision that we have as an organization, as as a podcast, is that arts that we elevate arts in the mind of American society so that arts artists and art is included in communicating public health information, that art everyone is has basic is basically equipped with the the tools that they need to express themselves i mean just like in health class i mean i think arts should be teach taught right along with with health education but then also that when someone is, is sick and does go into the hospital you know they're assigned a doctor a nurse and they also have an artist at their side that 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 the artist is an integral part of the care team um yeah i totally echo what, what you said naj like there's been many times that patients have have shared um suicidal ideations with our, our artist team um, or hallucinations that they're having. <laughs> That's a, a result of the, the treatment that they're on. And, you know, the because the artist was there and present, um, the patient was able to get the interventions that they needed. Um, and again, had better outcomes because of that. Well, a real pioneer in just what you described is the military at, at Walter Reed. Mm. So they have this um, center of excellence. And so and what they do is they have all the different types of medical people that uh, a patient will need, whatever it is, but they include an artist as part of that team mm-hmm. that's conferring with everybody else as an equal. And, and that is, there needs to be much more of that. So that that's, I think, um, what you just expressed is, is important and needed. And, mm-hmm. uh, there, and, and that's going to take you know, increasing awareness and respect of the power of the arts. And also going back to something you talked before is how we measure the art. Mm. There's a lot of different ways. If we just measure something one way, we're like the blind person hanging onto the trunk of the elephant elephant, and, and not seeing the whole elephant. And uh, so that's part of it is we also have to help people learn different ways in a sense of measuring the value of the arts. Mm. So, uh, and, uh, and I just think that there's, you know, there's, it's got to be a two-way street in terms mm. of this, this learning curve. You know, the arts were really a big part of medicine right up until sort of like the mid, mid-19th century. And, and particularly in, um, you know, thinking like in uh, mental care, you think of Van Gogh. You know, he was in a mental hospital and they, they gave him paint, you know, paint. Oh, my God, you know, get involved in that. But what happened is with the rise of the scientific method, that started all of a sudden they wanted that the art started getting pushed out because they were not fitting that same criteria. And then you have some, something like the Bauhaus that, you know, form um, follows function and all that stuff and didn't want any of that decorative stuff. And that gave us these all white hospitals, all white hallways and uh, just drove the arts out of uh, healthcare in many respects. And then a couple of interesting things meanwhile were slowly going on. One at the beginning of the uh, 20th century, the end of the uh, 19th century, uh, a doctor in Saranac Lake, Dr. Livingston Trudeau, was dealing with TB. And TB patients, one, you know, a lot of them were creative uh, because, you know, they live, artists live risky lives. Uh, but he and they were, you know, patients for long periods of time, and they were bored silly. 
And so this medical student who had come up from John Hopkins and been learning about the use of the decorative arts in terms of book binding and all that stuff, they decided to, to develop art classes for TB patients. And what was different was Trudeau measured the outcomes. Mm. He was the first to use that and realized this is making a difference in my patients' lives. Mm. And, I mean, and, then in, and then in World War I, you started, the military started doing that with people who were living with you know, what we now call PTSD. And they were starting to do it. And the military really is where a lot of the initial research that led to the creative arts therapies um, getting a real foothold came, really came out of working with the military. But that's so on one hand, you had at, at one level, you saw medical education driving the arts out. And at the same time, there was this grassroots growing movement to the creative arts therapies, learning certain tools and techniques. And, uh, you know, after when World War II happened, you, you had the uh, a birth, you know, huge birth explosion, and then you had the hospitals kept expanding. And then people couldn't find their way around. So they paint stripes on the floors. If we will follow the yellow stripe to uh, surgery or whatever. And then they found that they put a painting at a corner. People, was, it was much easier. And they weren't bumping into each other. You'd go down to the you know, painting of the yellow flowers and take a right. And when you see the elephant, take a left and sit down by the walrus or something. And people would find their way much quicker. And that started bringing the arts back into hospitals. I think it's so interesting. I love, I love that, you know, laying out kind of the history of arts being pushed out of medicine. And, um, oh my gosh, I have so many thoughts about this, but I, you know, the introduction show. of the scientific theory, um, like it seems like the the scientific theory or scientific investigation has had to you know has grown up over that time as well and there are new tools being created to specifically measure the impact that the arts have so it's not that the arts stopped having an impact or didn't have an impact just the the method that uh, people were using maybe to measure outcomes wasn't robust enough until more recently to measure outcomes right you know that the arts the arts can have and so there's specific tools being developed um for that which i think is fascinating well a guy named roger ulrich really sort of changed that whole thing because he did this study <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I think it was the late 1970s. And it was, you know, it, all things considered, if you have two patients, same disease, same place, and one was looking out a window and sawing a brick wall and the other saw nature, would mm -hmm. it make a difference? Well, the one seeing nature, you know, they were leaving the hospital 10% faster, using 10% fewer drugs and all this stuff, and it was saving the hospital money. Mm. And he showed them that, and they were like, Oh, really? Cool. And then uh, was, well, uh, what about this pa patients who look at the brick wall? What about if we put paintings of nature on the walls? Would that mm -hmm. make a difference? Well, yes, it did. Roger me 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 uh, measured that. And then they started realizing that, wait, wait, you start putting art up, it's making a difference. Mm -hmm. And so he was measuring it because of economic benefits, mm -hmm. which really helped I mean, one hand, the creative arts therapies are benefit, you know, pain reduction and all that stuff, which is extremely important. But all of a sudden, he was bringing a whole new way of lo looking at the value of the arts that really got CEOs' attention. Mm. Ooh, it's going to save us money. <laughs> oh, we well, like now, well, now with the Affordable Care Act, part of that legislation tied yeah. Medicare, Medicaid reimbursement to patient satisfaction scores yes. um, or HCAP scores. And, you know, it's been demonstrated time and time again that arts interventions in the healthcare space improves patient satisfaction scores, that's which right. increases revenue to the hospitals. That's right. Um, so that's, I think that's an important huge, um, piece huge, to. Huge, huge, yeah. huge, huge. Yeah, it is. And, uh, and there's still other ways of of measuring measuring it. You know, patient satisfaction tours is a meta a major driver. Uh, it happened out it, out in the Dells, Washington. There is this um, state of Washington. There was this little hospital. I think it was called the Dells, and they came up with this. It was a hospital with like I don't know, sixty beds, and they came up with the concept of patient centered care. 
Hmm. And they decided to create a hospital that incorporated the arts and good food and all this stuff to make patients happy. And it just, and then a guy named Bill Moyers filmed it hmm. and put it on national TV. And it was like, oh, we want that. You Why know? isn't this standard of care? Exactly. How crazy right. to try to make people and, feel better and in places really, where we're trying to make them feel better. That really helped transform <laughs> a couple of the Ehrlich's research really started transforming the design of hospitals and also, you know, the, but this totally different approach, patient-centered care. Now you have patient experience officers as mm. a major players in hospitals. And the arts are, they see this as uh, an important tool to their work because you're right, enhances patient uh, um, satisfaction studies. Well, and I think it's such a, it's such an exciting movement for you know, we've talked a lot about the impact on certain populations and for healthcare, but mm. there's a profound impact that this field, the, the elevation of this field can have on the arts community because artists, when they f discover this work, okay. it, it, they're just captivated by, by it. And uh, how do I be a part of this? We have, it's heartbreaking because <laughs> we have stacks of applications of artists and musicians that want to work with us and we just like don't have enough resources to like you know put them to work and um yeah. it, it's because it's deeply meaningful and impactful work and you don't have to explain w the impact of that the arts can have to an artist because they already know the re usually there we all come to the arts because we're trying to heal a part of ourselves that we can't figure out how to do another way except through the arts so we already know that in a very visceral and experiential level and then to have the opportunity to share that joy and then get paid for it you have a living wage um i mean can you uh, imagine that's peter senior that's peter senior you're talking his language <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know musicians who have played to hundreds and thousands of people who come into a hospital and hang out with someone for 20 minutes and sing just to them or play to them. And they're like, that was the best thing I've ever done. Oh, like, yeah. No question. The impact of that compared to all of those people, like no comparison, no comparison. Then they would do it every day if they could and never um, be in front of a crowd again. Makes me like tear up just thinking about it. It's so yeah. true. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, when I was at Dartmouth, I... Uh, well, before I started working in the med school, I worked for a year at the Performing Arts Center, the Hopkins Center, as a programmer. And so I'd write into the con contracts of various musicians. They, they always gave you a certain amount of time that they normally would spend teaching uh, music students. And I would take half that time and have them, assuming depending on the right instrument, um, playing in the hospital for patients. And uh, because I felt you know, if I bring the Performing Arts Center to the hospital, patients and nurses and doctors will be grateful and they will want to come see concerts. And I remember there's one musician who, you know, he plays Carnegie Hall and all that stuff. He's got the Stradivarius and the whole bit. And he thought, you're kidding. And I said, but it's in your contract. He said, <laughs> he said, but any of these music students can do that. And I said, any pre-med student can also do your surgery too, right? Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, just because somebody's not hostile doesn't mean they don't deserve the best. Mm. Uh, he was in his contract. He had a choice. He was like, glaring at his manager. So we take him down to the hospital. And you go out of a room, and a patient is just not up for it. And then he says, does she know who I am? I said, I don't think she cares. No. Her. <laughs> and so, you know, the next room, same thing. He now thinks I'm setting him up. I said, honestly, you know, you got to give a patient's choice. You just mm -hmm. can't come in and play for them. You got to ask them if they would like to now. Is this okay? And if it's not, you know, I mean, the nurse thought these were possibilities, but, you know, what can I say? You know, they're not doing it. They're in the hospital. So the third one says, oh, I see you have a pile in with you. Sure. And he's, you know, and she says, uh, can you play, I don't know, Mozart? Can I play Mozart? He's like, nobody ever asked him that question. He <laughs> starts going for it. And the tears are pouring down her face. She's lying. Uh -huh. Just after 15 minutes, I said, you know, we got to move on. He's on edge. 
this is incredible. I mean, I said, you know, there are other patients. We just can't stay the whole time here. Mm. And so we go to another room and now you can imagine this music going through the hospital. And the first patient says, I think I'd like to hear the musician now. <laughs> and uh, so he was supposed to have like, give me an hour and a half, two hours. His manager says, we've got to go, you know. He, he said, now nah, this is the best concert. This is the best time I've ever had in my life. I finally learned what music is all about. Mm. It's true. Oh. Wow. Amen. Oh my gosh. Oh, well, that's so much. I'm like crying right now. It's so, it, it's so profoundly yeah. sacred and it just, it, it is absolutely that this is why we were given the arts. I, I love this quote by Arna Garberg. Um, he says that, uh, to love someone is to learn the song that is in their heart. Oh, wow. And then to sing it back to them when they have forgotten. Oh. And we just get to do that all the time. And That's it's right. so, oh, I just love it so much. <laughs> it's the hardest, best job you can ever It have. is. It's right. brutal. You know, yeah. our when we work on the oncology, oh, unit, about, I know. it has about it. We have about a 70% mortality rate. So about, 70% oh, yeah. of the patients that we work with will eventually die from their cancer. Um, and so there's a lot of loss and a lot of um, end of life and all of that. Um, but it's, and it's so difficult and self-care is so important. Um, but it's also the best. It's the most sacred, beautiful, precious um, place to work. It's so cool. I love it. You have to make yourself vulnerable to that experience. That's where the safety yeah. is. The doctor who puts up the wall actually yep. is going to have, you know, they're going to have drinking problems and all sorts of stuff. Uh, but to me, you know, when you go in into that ward, into those patient rooms, you're an answer to somebody's prayer. I mean, that's one of the profound things about this type of work. You have brought in this moment of grace. Mm. And I will never forget this one patient. And uh, and I, you know, this got him to learn how to do a little very simple weaving three days before he died. I mean, never, you know, <laughs> I'm dying. Well, why are you dying? Why do you why not you <laughs> learn how to do it? You know, what else you gotta do? And and then one time and I at one point I took him to this reading because I we had these monthly where we get some person of the medical community tells a story and there's this uh it was a head of um oh, it was I think it's the head of fundraising or something like this. You know, the head of uh human resources, she was sharing how poetry really helped her through through cancer. And uh and afterwards he says, Ned, you just gave me the greatest gift in the world. Mm. And that night he died. Mm. It helped him let go. Yeah. And he died in peace. He died with a smile on his face. And, uh, you know, so, you know, and, and it's so important for people to understand that death is part of life. You know, you mm. want to, you want to have a person have a good life and a good death and a good experience. And, mm -hmm. you know, when somebody's dying, they get four big issues. They don't want to die in pain. They don't want, want to die on, alone. They want to leave no thing unsaid. Mm -hmm. and they want to leave a legacy. Mm -hmm. The arts can help with all four of those. Yes. I had a, I've, we had a wonderful patient that we got to work with for a long period of time. And her, um, she was one of those that discovered she was an artist in the hospital and made beautiful <laughs> artwork. And her family, after she passed, turned all of her artwork into a book into cards um, uh, and it was this like beautiful legacy that she was able to leave her her family and her children and her grandchildren and um that happens so often and it's so cool to be a part get to you know be a small part of it, of that of just like reintroducing people to their creativity a great gift that uh, some people make is leaving their bodies to medical education. Oh, that's so, what I want to do. Just in case my husband forgets, 
and for public record. I that's well, yes. it's important. <laughs> um, uh, like at, at Dartmouth, you know, we have this, you know, this service. But it, it, the important thing is, is that, you know, for medical students, they meet their cadaver on the first day of med school. And this is a traumatic experience. It's not an easy experience. And it's a profound gift uh, that somebody, you know, gives them to help them, you know, learn how the body works. And uh, and certain parts when they get to work on the hands or the face are really difficult. Um, and I was doing, I would do life drawing classes at the same time. So that they were having a different way of seeing these naked bodies and expressing themselves. But mm. then we had the med students at the end. Uh, what happens is the families of the people who uh, gave their bodies uh, come together. And you know the pa uh, these med students never know the name of, the, of that person. And so they see this group of people and what they do is they sh share through poetry and music and other things that they've created what that gift meant to them. Wow. And for a lot of the families, like dad gave his body that somebody's going to be cutting up. You know, it's very hard for mm -hmm. a lot of loved ones to accept that. But this, this ritual, this use of the arts to express the prof how profound that gift has been to these med students and how the med students really, you know, really thank somebody for this experience, this wonderful experience they've gone through, hard as it was, and everything else, is a more. It's just it's a magical moment. Wow! And really uh, cool. so the arts can be really, you know, important to help, you know, the medical students, the patients, in so many different ways. The family members all come together around a good death. And mm. and and the gift that they uh, that a good deaf can make in a variety mm. of ways. It's beautiful. It's amazing to hear like how I mean, just I've learned just in this last hour all like different ways how the art it, arts are like intersecting, and we don't even we don't even know. Um, how can people best reach out to both of you if they want to connect, if they want to be on the podcast, or if they want to join <laughs> Noah? Uh, you know, you can. I'm on. You can reach me through uh, the National Organization for Arts and Health, or the firm I work for, Aesthetics Inc., which is based in San Diego. And um, you know, contact us here at Arts for the uh, for the Arts for the Health of It. And uh, you know, yeah, we'd let's love to feature together. you. Let's, let's talk and uh, let's learn from each other. Yeah, you can email us at podcast at heartsneedart.org. And someone, me, will answer that email because I'm the <laughs> one that has access to it. <laughs> well, thank you both very much for talking to me today. I'm really excited about this journey that we are all on. And wherever this takes us, I'm super excited to be a part of it. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you, Richard. You're Thanks a for pleasure. Being here. All right, everyone, keep creating. We'll see you next time. Bye. Okay. Thank you for listening to Arts for the Health of It. A podcast produced by Hearts Need Art, creative support for patients and caregivers, in partnership with the National Organization for Arts and Health. You can help others learn about the healing power of the arts by subscribing, sharing, and reviewing the podcast wherever you listen or watch. The podcast is hosted by Richard Wilmore, co-hosted by Constanza Rader, and produced by Ivan Briones. Our theme song, Songbird, is written and performed by Natalie Lane. Visit heartsneedart.org to learn how you can support our mission to create joy with people facing life-altering health challenges. Join us next week to learn more ways you can create arts for the health of it. The views expressed on this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views of Hearts Need Art, their staff, board members, or other affiliates. All content is created for informational purposes only. This podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice or to diagnose and treat any health condition. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health professional with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you heard on this podcast.